SI units gonna be the topic in this very first lesson in my brand new general physics playlist. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, before we dive into this lesson, I just want to give you a little background to the entire playlist here. So over the course of the next nine months, we're going to be releasing somewhere probably in the ballpark of like 90 or 100 lessons, spanning 25 chapters of an entire year of university uh, algebra-based general physics. Uh, for those of you that are taking calculus-based physics, you'll probably still benefit greatly from this course, but it will be lacking the calculus element to it. Now, I know that physics is a difficult subject, one that a lot of students struggle with, but we're gonna try and eliminate some of the barriers that make it a little more challenging. And one of the things we're gonna do is introduce new concepts with examples that are likely to be things you encounter in your everyday life. And this is gonna be a lot easier to do in the first half of the course where we're dealing with Newtonian mechanics, which involves things you're likely to encounter every day of your life. So we're gonna deal with like a stone falling through the air in the context of gravity and throwing a ball through the air or driving down the road in a car, all things you're likely to be somewhat familiar with uh, in varying degrees. That's gonna make it a little easier to conceptualize the material and provide a context uh, that kind of you know, makes the, the barrier of entry a little lower. Uh, the other thing we're gonna do is try and at least initially eliminate some of the math. Now, the truth is you can't eliminate math from physics. Math is built into physics. However, one of the things that makes physics most difficult is when a, uh, a concept is introduced with a lot of math involved. And what I'm gonna make a point of doing is when I introduce a concept, is introducing it in the context of a problem where the math is something you can do in your head by eliminating the need for a calculator. So we eliminate that math barrier and you can focus just on that conceptual understanding. And then as we kind of master that concept, we can start introducing problems that involve a little more math, things you're likely to encounter in your physics course. Now in the second half of the course, which deals with a lot with electricity and magnetism, we're actually gonna struggle to introduce concepts in a context of things you're likely to be able to conceptualize that are part of your everyday life. But what we can do is relate those back to similar concepts from say gravity and things of this sort. So hopefully you get a good mastery of the material in the first half, because then in the second half we relate right back to that. And so even though it involves some subjects that are gonna be a little more challenging for you to conceptualize, because it is very similar conceptually in certain ways to what we learned in the first half, it'll make it much more accessible. And one last thing before we dive into this lesson. So regardless of how good the quality of instruction you are receiving, the real mastery of physics is always gonna take place when you are practicing on your own. You've gotta get some practice in one way, shape, or form. And might I recommend my general physics master course at chadsprep.com. So there are quizzes following all these video lessons. There are study guides to go with it. Uh, and the most valuable part of this course, in my opinion, is that with these quizzes, there are detailed written solutions, but more important, almost every problem has a video solution to go with it, where I can explain to you how to approach the problem, how you should be looking at the problem, and then how to solve the problem as well. But even if you're not using my course, get some serious practice in. Any standard textbook you're likely to be using is gonna have uh, plenty of practice at the end of every chapter. So let's talk about SI units. Now, first thing you should realize is that SI stands for the Système International. These are the French lords of the units. They make sure to define all the units and relate them back to something in nature that doesn't change. That way, these units are defined in such a way that they're not gonna change over time and stuff as well. So, uh, but these are the base units right here. And then we have a number of what we call derived units that are all derived from some combination of these base units. So if we take a look at these base units, we got length in meters, mass in kilograms, time in seconds, the amount of a substance in moles, temperature in Kelvin, electric current in amperes, and luminous intensity in candelas. Now, we'll start introducing more of these as they become relevant. Like we won't really talk about amperes until somewhere in the second semester topics and things of a sort. We'll briefly talk about candelas, if at all, uh, uh, in one little chapter and things of a sort. So, but for now, the three most important ones that we'll encounter quite a bit early on are gonna be length in meters, mass in kilograms, and time in seconds. And you're gonna to wanna to get used to the idea that when you're doing calculations, that before you ever do some plugging and chugging, you need to make sure your numbers are in the proper units. So say for instance, if your length is not given in meters, but say in centimeters, 
right off the bat as you're reading the problem, you see it's in centimeters, a bell should go off in your head that says, oh, I'm gonna have to convert that to meters before I do any sort of calculation. Same thing with mass, you know, in chemistry, uh, we use SI units quite a bit of the time, but not all the time. You're gonna find out in physics, you need to use SI units almost all the time. And I say almost, I would just recommend all the time. So in chemistry, we're much more likely to you know, use masses in grams, but it turns out the SI unit's not the gram, it's the kilogram. And so if I give you a mass in grams and a problem, again, bells should be going off in your head that you're gonna to need to convert that to kilograms before ever doing any plugging and chugging. So time in seconds. If the time's given in minutes or hours, again, bells should be going off in your head that you're probably gonna to have to convert that to seconds before you ever do any plugging and chugging in any kind of mathematical problem. So, those are some of the things there. Let's talk about some of the drive units that go with this. So we'll start with area. So an area, which is like length times width uh, of a square and things of a sort, or, or a rectangle, is gonna be length squared, and so it's gonna have units of meters squared. And that's a derived unit. It's not a base unit, but it is derived from the unit of length, in this case, length squared. Same thing with volume. So volume, you can look at the, the volume of a cube as length times width times height, and it's gonna be meters times meters times meters, and so the SI unit, again, another derived unit, is gonna be meters cubed. Now I point out this one in particular because just like in chemistry where mass is often given in grams, not the SI unit of kilograms, oftentimes in chemistry as well, we, we like to use liters quite a bit, or milliliters, not meters cubed, but you need to know that the SI unit is meters cubed, and if you're doing calculations in a physics class, uh, odds are you're probably gonna need to convert that volume into meters cubed before you do some plugging and chugging. All right, let's talk another place where units can be helpful, and that's in what we call dimensional analysis. So let's say we take a look at velocity for just a second. So and if you look at your study guide there, you can see that the SI derived unit for velocity is meters per second, meters per second. Now, let's talk about what velocity is. So, uh, and again, if you're from this lovely country as I am, you might be more comfortable with miles per hour, but it's a, a unit of length over a unit of time. So you might like think that, oh, so velocity is some sort of length over time. So, and it is, it turns out the actual definition of velocity, so is what we call the displacement over time. So and in this case, displacement's often uh, given in a one-dimensional system in terms of x. So it's kind of how we'll define it here in this case. Um, but it is a displacement over time, a length over time, which is where the units come from. So it matches. And so sometimes dimensional analysis can give us an idea of maybe how we perform a calculation, maybe if we're a little uncomfortable with where to figure out where to start with a problem and stuff like that, it can give us an idea. So if you see that you need to calculate a velocity and the units are meters per second, then you might look at what's provided and be like, well, what's given in meters, what's given in seconds? Now, caveat to this. So just because you've got the units in front of you and stuff, it actually is not always gonna give you the proper equation and stuff like that. You might find out that, uh, it might give you a good place uh, of where to start and stuff like this, but you might find that instead of inequality, you've got a proportionality. So, and maybe there's a proportionality constant involved. And so if all you do is just divide the appropriate units in such a way or multiply the units in such a way that it gives you the units you need in a multiple choice question, you might find that's not actually the right answer because you needed some sort of proportionality constant in there or something like that. In the case of velocity here, it works out great. Let's do one more here. Let's talk about acceleration. So acceleration, it turns out, has units of meters per second squared. And so you might look at this as length over time squared. So, and that might be one way to look at it. You also, it turns out, could have looked at it as the change in velocity over the change in time. And velocity, we already determined, was gonna be meters per second, and then time, second as well. And you put those together and it becomes meters per second squared. And again, once again, if you were provided with a change in velocity in meters per second, and you're provided with some period of time in seconds, you might've been like, well, what if I divide the one by the other? It would give me the units I need. And again, we call this dimensional analysis. Now, my hope again is that you actually get a little more of an intuitive feel for the material and aren't so reliant on such things, but this is just another tool to have in your tool bag uh, in how we approach problems sometimes. Now, one more thing I wanna talk about here, and it deals with some of those derived units again, and we got these seven base units, and we'll find out with some of those derived units, instead of just you know, expressing them as some combination of the base units, like meters per second squared here, or meters per second here, you'll find out that they're gonna give it a new name. And it turns out like for something like force, so it turns out the derived SI unit is the Newton. 
And you might be like, well, Chad, that's not a combination of these base units. And you're right. It doesn't appear that it is, except that it is. <laughs> but they took that combination, and instead of writing that combination out all the time, they said, we'll call that combination the Newton. And so how would we figure out what this combination is? Well, it turns out you've got a lot of different equations for force that you're gonna be given. And it turns out you could use any one of those equations to try and come up with what the derived unit Newton is actually equal to. And it turns out the most famous equation for force you're gonna be given is Newton's second law. So a Newton's second law is gonna say that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And so what, if you wanna figure out what the Newton is, which is the unit for force, well, then you're just gonna plug in the units for mass and acceleration right next to it. And so in this case, you can see that the Newton, which is what force is measured in, is gonna be equal to mass, which is the kilogram, times acceleration, which we said was meters per second squared. And so it turns out a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. That's what a Newton is. So every once in a while you get presented a problem where you've actually got to derive what a particular unit is expressed in base units like the Newton or maybe like the Joule for energy. And the Joule can be expressed as some combination of these base units as well. And all you've got to do is find one of the equations you have for energy. We'll find out we've got several of them. We've got an ener you know, equations for potential energy and kinetic energy and work, which has typically got energy units, things of a sort. And you could use any one of those to come up with some derived uh, or some expression for the uh, derived unit of joules, let's say, just like we did for the Newton here. Now normally I'd like to combine in with this lesson talking about the metric system and unit conversions. But before we start doing any calculations, we actually got to talk about significant figures. Uh, and in the context of that, I also want to talk about scientific notation. So and it turns out this is really important when it comes to both physics and engineering. Uh, and the truth is it should be more fairly important in chemistry as well, though we kind of ignore it quite a bit. But you're going to find out it's not ignored quite so much in physics. So we've got to have that discussion before we start doing any calculations. That way we express the answers to our unit conversions properly. So in the next lesson, we'll talk about scientific notation and significant figures, and then we'll follow it up with a lesson on unit conversions. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, the best way you can express your gratitude is a like. It's also the best way you can make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. Happy studying.